Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are when you log in. Welcome to this episode of Trade Winds. We are going to talk about AI and trade, artificial intelligence and trade. Everybody talks about AI right now, but what is it actually? And how can it be helpful in trade? How can we regulate it or should we regulate it? My name is Cecilia Malmström. I'm a non-resident senior fellow at Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington. And I have two great guests with me here today who will help us to understand the this, this topic. We have Eva Maidel from the European Parliament. She is a member of the European Parliament and a so-called rapporteur for the AI Act, meaning that she was the, uh, the person responsible for pushing the legislation through the European legislative uh, process. And we have Professor Joshua P. Melser, who is a senior fellow for Global Economy and Development Program at Brookings Institute. So a warm welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining. Thank you. So we have an intense debate today about artificial intelligence, and we know it can be a great tool to help us with many things. And it can also fundamentally change trade and international business models. How? Well, it can help with transparency, tracking, diversification of supply chains, etc. Uh, but how would this work in practice for someone who, who trades, who exports? And how shall we regulate it? Can you help us clarifying these things? Uh, starting with you, Josh, what is artificial intelligence and how can it influence trade patterns? Um, so, so it's great to be here. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. And, and it's a pleasure to see Eva again. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a really important question. What is it, What is artificial intelligence? Because despite uh, all, all the attention um, to this still uh, a, a technology where we haven't reached a global consensus on what we're talking about. And there are some helpful uh, attempts at definitions in the direction that uh, attempt to put some boundaries around it. But I think hopefully it will sort of become clear that we need to be quite um, careful about what we're thinking about in AI and that we're thinking about it in, in bounded ways. The, the OECD has been doing quite a bit of work in this space for a while, and they have a definition which is sort of being picked up by a lot of other governments and adapted a little, but it seems to be a good starting point for thinking about what is artificial intelligence. And, and they essentially describe it as a, machi a machine-based system um, with, with objectives um, inferred from input that it receives and then generates essentially, you know, outputs such as recommendations and so forth. So quite a, quite a general um, approach uh, to thinking about it and potentially quite broad, uh, but certainly have this, this, this notion of it being a machine-based system that is essentially receiving inputs and, and generating outputs. Now, we have been in a world of hyper-attention to artificial intelligence, I think, certainly in the last year or so since the release of ChatGPT and large language models, or we can call them generative AI. But artificial intelligence, or often sometimes referred to as forms of machine learning, where you essentially get large amounts of data, analyze it and make predictions about the future, has been around quite a bit longer. And so there are, um, and and so the, the the uses of artificial intelligence, I think, and how we think about it from a regulatory perspective, from a trade perspective, I think, need to sort of think carefully through the kind of more newer foundational um, or frontier model forms of AI that have become really a focus of policymaking attention with ChatGPT and LLMs, and I think there are good reasons for that focus because they raise different risks and they potentially going to be extremely powerful. And I'm sure Eva will get into what that development meant for the AI Act over the last 12 months. Uh, but the the EU, EU has been working on AI for a number of years now. Other governments have been looking at it. So it, it has been around for a while and has been used by businesses, even if we're not talking about the foundational AI models. Let me just say quickly a couple of things about what makes foundational AI models sort of so much more you know, important from a regulatory and policy making perspective than sort of more traditional AI ML forms. And that is, you know, there are a couple of key features to them. One of them is that we've been in this world of um, sort of exponential growth, both in data and, and computer processing power. 
and 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 this this term gets used a lot, like the exponential growth of, of processing power and AI, AI compute. But it's very very hard, I think, for us as mere mortals to understand how powerful that kind of exponential growth has been. One one a, a colleague of mine who works on this kind of made the observation to me that if you work if you walked. Uh, if you put one foot in front of the other and you did that 30 times, so you think about the distance that you would cover, you'd probably cover, you know, a, a classroom back and forth or a, a large kind of meeting room back and forth, right? You do 30 steps essentially, right? If you did that exponentially, so you did one step, then two steps, then four steps and eight steps, and you did that 30 times, how far do you think you would go? Would you go, you know, across the United States? Would you go from New York to London? You'd actually go essentially from the earth to the moon and back again. Um, that that's how far you would go if you sort of were doing this in an exponential way. And this is what's been happening with essentially compute. It's been growing exponentially now for decades. And it is, we're sort of in this world where we're doubling capacity um, rapidly and the capacity that's coming online is very, very powerful. And LLMs are very much benefiting from this growth in compute. So it's exponential. So we have this huge scaling of compute a huge scaling of training data. And what this is meaning is a couple of things, that that the, the, the these systems have got what's often referred to as transfer learning. So it means that they are gaining knowledge on one task and being able to apply it to other tasks. So it's, a, it's not general AI in the form of supercomputing, intelligent, conscious AI, but it's a form of AI which is not so task-specific as it used to be, but actually can be applied across multiple tasks. And so that gen generalizable capacity is very new and important Important. The other is that as we scale it, the actual um, performance is also improving dramatically. Uh, so we're actually getting this not this very, very significant improvement in capacity and the capacity to perform more accurate, more targeted tasks and produce more insightful outcomes is growing exponentially. And new capabilities are also emerging as the system scales. Uh, so new capabilities to perform tasks and understanding what these capabilities are, understanding how the AI performs is actually a new challenge that LLMs and generative AI and these foundational AI models bring to the space. So this is why we're getting this sort of much greater focus on risks and also opportunities that I think requires a particular kind of regulatory response is really important from a trade and economic perspective as well. So let me let me stop there. That was quite a bit of an introduction. I'm happy to get into any of those topics in more detail. Well, thank you very much Josh, for setting the the scene. We'll get into to the more more details on on, on trade. Eva, uh, you've been working on on this, you know, day and night the the last years, and we'll come to the AI Act in a moment. But but first, how how do you see this? How can AI influence business models and 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 trade, and and our general thinking about more efficient inter interconnections? Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, Cecilia, thank you very much uh, for uh, having me. It's uh, indeed uh, busy times here at the European uh, Parliament, but I guess for everyone that's on this uh, webinar as well in your respective uh, areas uh, and, and fields, I feel that the work all of a sudden, particularly in the tech domain, um, has been uh, truly uh, tripled, quadrupled over the past couple uh, of years. So we've been kept busy. Um, but for me as a policymaker, it has always been important uh, not just to be busy and to produce, uh, you know, a certain amount of legislative files, but actually for them to fit together like a di digital jigsaw, for them to make some sort of sense. Um, so I hope we've done that and we could talk about the AI Act in a little bit. But maybe to your question, um, I think the way I, I see it and, and how um, artificial intelligence is transforming international um, uh, trade is probably in three or four areas uh, that at least I am more uh, familiar uh, with. And one of them is related to optimizing supply chains. Um, that's a very interesting uh, topic and area for me because I've been also the rapporteur of the European Chips Act. Um, and um, obviously one of the reasons why we had the Chips Act introduced is particularly because of the disruption on some of those supply chains. So uh, AI can be very beneficial uh, when we we use its uh, algorithms to analyze uh, transportation rules data, demands for goods, uh, when it comes to the type of inventory uh, levels that are out there, the relevant uh, trade uh, aspects of, of, of all of this. 
Um, but I think it could also be a very, uh, it, it could enable businesses to improve the forecasting accuracy, to minimize costs, to enhance efficiency uh, when it comes to all this cross-border transportation uh, of goods. So that would be one area where I think if we use um, AI uh, in, a, in, a, in a very concrete manner, uh, we could um, have uh, way better uh, results um, and have those supply chains uh, much more uh, resilient apart from them being uh, optimized. Um, I think it's also um, important uh, to use um, AI algorithms when it comes to providing market intelligence. Um, that could help us um, provide better and identify market trends um, to enable businesses to be make better informed uh, commercial decisions, um, but also uh, help businesses improve risk assessment and also when it comes to fraud detection. So I think um, using uh, those algorithms to support businesses could uh, only uh, contribute uh, to um, um, yeah, growth in the end of the day. Uh, if we look at some of the um, numbers, uh, what the profit and economic gains can be when we use uh, AI, I mean, it could deliver an additional economic uh, global activity of around 13 trillion by 2030. Um, so um, I think uh, looking at some of the forecasts and data that are provided by um, important organizations such as the International Telecommunications Union, I think it's important to kind of understand that everybody now speaks about the potential, but I think we need to get into concreteness. And that's why I think today's um, webinar is important because it, it's focusing on a certain area um, and a certain um, aspect. Um, yeah, but there's, uh, I'm sure, some better prepared people to talk about AI and trade, um, uh, you, yourself included, of course, uh, that could outline a, a couple of other areas where AI could be uh, helpful for international business models. Well, that all sounds very good, but but how concretely will this happen, that, that you can better manage your, your, your stock taking, that, that you have a better overview of your supply chains and, and your um, knowing more about, about supply and demand? If I am a company who exports pence to, 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 to the world, how would it affect me more concretely, Josh? Um, yeah, so great, great question. And and so maybe maybe can I can I answer back into that question because I, I really want to um, just build on what Eva said because I think she you know, she was she's exactly right and it really it was a very helpful description of the landscape. I think of the different ways it can affect it. W one of the things I think that is is interesting in this space when you think about the impact on on trade and getting to the concreteness is that there's been a discussion you know, for a while now about peak globalization, you know, trade has peaked and so forth. And this is certainly, you know, being more or less true when we talk about goods trade. Um, it's peaked at different rates for different countries. Some for some countries it's flatlined, it hasn't really peaked. So the peak description is actually a little misleading, but let's just say for argument's sake, goods trade is largely peaked. But what is not peaked is services trade. Services trade, in fact, has been growing, growing very strongly. And, and in fact, um, if you look at this category of, of what they call of what's sort of in the statistics defined as modern services, so if you take out tourism um, and, and you take out um, transportation, which is very linked to goods trade, um, you have uh, modern services trade now comprising around 20% of total goods and services trade up from 12% in 2008, which is when the sort of the peak globalisation period sort of is meant to have happened. So we've had this very strong growth in services trade and a lot of that has been um, in things like um, R&D, uh, professional services, management, consulting, uh, technical, uh, finance, trade-related services, and so forth. And these are the types of services that can be provided firstly online. Um, so they're increasingly digital services uh, that they've been delivered through the use of data flows. They're also the types of services that are using um, artificial intelligence and, and actually have been using it for quite a while now in, in various ways. Uh, so, so that's the first thing. The, the, other, the other piece is that 
a lot of these business services and modern, you know, whether it's finance or consulting or professional, are inputs into supply chains, um, and and you actually see that the value of these types of services in sophisticated supply chains today has has gone up dramatically, and the the countries that are actually producing sophisticated products using supply chains are actually not only heavily increasing the value added of these services in those supply chains, which basically means they're using a lot of them, um, but it also means that they're actually importing them. Um, so you actually see the import share of these services into supply chains has also grown. So it's, we've actually got a much more sort of globalised, services-driven um, sort of trading environment that's often not being reflected well in the data and it's also being uh, increasingly relying on cross-border data flows and using AI to do it more effectively and more efficiently. Now, the other piece where AI is having a really big impact, and this is really, we're only at the beginning of this, is the way AI is going to affect jobs. Um, because mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of the trade in these services is, is at some level kind of being driven by, you know, different labour costs, um, even in the professional services space around the world. And that will grow because one of the things that AI is doing is it's reducing barriers to services trade. So we've traditionally had a lot of regulatory barriers. We've had licensing requirements and so forth, which have restricted trade in services. But we've also had a lot of technical barriers. We just haven't been able to actually perform that trade. We may have had language barriers, which meant if you were not an English speaker, you couldn't really provide a professional service to an English speaking market. Um, internet connections, um, you, know, you had to travel to deliver the service. And so now a lot of the data flow, the global internet, but now artificial intelligence through, you know, very sophisticated translation services, for instance, are actually reducing these technical barriers to services trade as well. Um, it is also changing the nature of the jobs, right? Like there's a lot of conversation at the moment around which jobs are going to get lost um, because AI is going to automate them and increasing focus on sort of more sophisticated white collar jobs which jobs might be augmented by artificial intelligence? What are the new jobs that are going to come online um, as we start using artificial intelligence? And this will also change trade patterns. Um, it will certainly change services trade as some services jobs um, get done domestically that were previously done through um, a trade function. Um, some services trade that happens at the moment will be augmented and will become even more productive and so forth. And so these types of patterns are playing out in different ways as well. So we're seeing this happening in multiple ways. Um, the, the final piece is that, and the, one of the reasons I sort of wanted to separate out a little at the beginning of the conversation, the difference sort of between the foundational AI, which is very important, that's certainly the translation services that you're seeing with Google Bard and so forth, uh, part of that kind of LLM, large language model world. But we've also seen a lot of these um, you know, data-driven AI applications happening kind of at the industry level, at the enterprise level to improve forecasting, sales management, better advertising, targeting, tracking and tracing goods across supply chains and so forth. And this has been going on for a number of years. It's also one of the data points that gets um, talked about a little in terms of the aggregate benefits from these large language models from this 2023 McKinsey report where they sort of looked at um, I think 60 odd use cases and they came up with a figure of about two and a half to four and a half trillion dollars annually of increasing in GDP. What's also in the report is that this is on top of the um this is also on top of sort of the 11 to 17 trillion dollars that is going to be generated by more typical forms of AI machine learning, right? So this is this is the, this is part of the story, but the big story is also a lot of these kind of enterprise level AI uses. And, and the reason I keep sort of coming back to this a little from a regulatory trade perspective is that we we can at times policymakers, I think, get a little bit sidetracked by the newest and the kind of the biggest and the most dangerous thing out there. And certainly, again, I do think LLMs raise real issues in terms of risks and magnifying existing risks that deserve regulatory attention. But when you think about the trade opportunities for a lot of the world, when you think about the development opportunities in the global south for AI and how trade can facilitate that, a lot of that's going to be fairly 
um, you know, kind of unsexy but important enterprise level AI off the shelf tools that they will be using to essentially increase their productivity and efficiency and around all these types of areas that we've just been talking about. That's been happening. That can be, that pace needs to be accelerated dramatically. Um, and there's a lot of tools both on the trade policy front, but also elsewhere that need to be used to essentially create that opportunity. Uh, but I think that's also where we're seeing um, a lot of the kind of trade opportunity play out as well. Do you see this as well, Eva? Do you see this is happening today? I mean, lots of small companies, because initially they will require quite some investments to build up and, and to, to, to sort of acquire these capacities. And then if you if you replace uh, your your traditional translators with, with an AI system who will help you to to understand uh, the requirements of the Japanese market or what have you, um, I mean th th this is quite a lot of investment. Is this going to happen today, or what? What do you see uh, time frame wise? Um, I mean, I'll be honest. I think for me personally, it will be a little bit difficult to judge and give a particular time frame. But again, there has been a number of reports um, that have circulated from reputable organizations um, that most of them agree to a very big extent what uh, Joshua uh, mentioned, particularly when it comes to the risk associated with the changes of the job market, um, but also with the opportunities that businesses um, and particularly small businesses uh, should reap the potential that AI um, uh, provides. Uh, when it comes to small businesses, I think we need to think that most uh, small and medium enterprises are much more agile. They're better positioned to experiment with different AI solutions. Um, and so I think um, what from a European perspective, we should be doing if we would like to see uh, the next European Commission, European Parliament, truly focusing a little bit more into the competitiveness uh, area and trying to uh, encourage growth, economic growth uh, in Europe. We really need to uh, go to those companies uh, that have their strengths, sometimes in the services area, sometimes in manufacturing. Uh, they're not necessarily tech unicorns, the companies that I'm talking about, but these are companies that can very successfully um, endorse the latest emerging technologies and propel their businesses forward. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it's not about the commission issuing recommendations, how this should be done. It has to happen in a way, in a natural form uh, and way. And there are already a lot of companies that are trying to facilitate um, uh, that connection in between the AI providers and and those that have a more traditional way of, of operating. Um, in a way, we need to bring our traditional businesses up to speed with the latest uh, technological advancements. And I think there should be certain help, support, awareness, but it's ultimately up to, to the business and the way it things and its mentality and Europe is not known to be the most uh, risk taking uh, culture. We are more on the risk averse side of things. Um, but I believe it's, you know, it's the narrative is the opportunities that are out there and it's under the understanding that the slower you implement those changes, the likelihood you're going to lose out on the economic potential um, and your profits are, are much uh, bigger. Having said that, talking about the risks um, and understanding them, I think it's important. And I think the difference here, when we speak about the job market and many tasks being automated, according to some, um, I think it's important for um, governments, member states in the EU, uh, but also nation states in, in general, um, to understand that we have had changes before on the job market. However, this time things are happening at a faster pace and probably there it's, it's a very different way, the way the societal effect will be felt or it's already being felt. Um, so I think we need to take that into consideration. But in the same time, I think we also need to look in the past uh, 10, 20, 30 years where certain changes have happened again slightly faster than uh, years before that, and we've managed to adapt. Um, this doesn't mean that I'm necessarily positive on that uh, topic, that it will have no disturbance. That's not what I'm trying to say. I just think that we're entering a new 
and a different way of how the job market will be disrupted and will be changed. And I think a conversation is necessary where we are all brought up to the same speed of the way change is happening, particularly traditional institutions. I'm not entirely sure we have the prepared and professionals in the institutions. I'm neither sure that political leaders see so it's either you currently you see political leaders either scaring citizens about what's coming up uh, or either neglecting the topic uh, and saying there will be no problem. And probably the truth is somewhere in the middle. And it would be important uh, if there's more societal conversations and more understanding how we can all better prepare for those disruptions that in some in some areas are already happening also for other reasons. Uh, in the past two, three years, we had a number of reasons why those disruptions have happened. Sorry. Yes, this is this is very interesting. Obviously, I mean, the technology, the digitalization, automatization, robotization is something that has been ongoing for 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 decade, and we've always needed to adapt and the labor force and and investing in in skills and training and education uh, and so on. The, 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 the difference is that it goes so quick right now. So, so policymakers do not really have, uh, you know, have not really had the possibility to to catch up. So this is obviously something that that needs to be invested in. And 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 you also mentioned Eva that that companies also sector wise are already trying to to develop patterns and and forms of cooperation uh, between them, which is a natural thing to do but but still if we want to take all the advantages from artificial intelligence in trade we do need some sort of permissive regulatory framework and what's happening right now and you both both alluded to it is that we have different uh, regulations the ai act will enter into force very quickly and this is a, a very broad uh, and complex uh, piece of legislation with uh, with lots of of, of layers, uh, and then we have uh, OECD recommendations that you refer to, Joshua, and then we have um, the the G seven and the Trade and Tech Council have some some principles. We have the US has a more decentralized uh, approach, and then we have lots of things happening in Asia as well. So, so how how can all this come together so that it is helpful and not not uh, sort of hampering innovation and cooperation? Maybe AI, uh, you yeah. can start here about, because, to, and tell us a little bit about the AI Act in Europe. Yeah, perfect. Um, I will um, yeah, explain a little bit more where we are at the moment, because we are almost at the very, very final uh, stages and, and briefly what the, the AI Act is, is about. Um, there's, uh, we've been working for over two years on this um, document, um, and just yesterday we adopted the final version in committee in the European Parliament, and we just have one last step that's going to take place in April when we adopt the final text in um, in, in in plenary. And the, the bigger, big picture thinking idea behind it is that we've managed to lay out the common European vision for the future of artificial intelligence. Uh, one, which is uh, making sure that this technology is developed in a more democratic, transparent and uh, safe uh, way. We have put down um, certain guardrails to ensure that AI systems are um, um, safe, uh, as I said, uh, but in the same time, I believe there are certain provisions in the text um, that can balance well the safety, but also the openness to innovation. I need to warn and, and say that after all, this was not a file that was aimed at making Europe necessarily more competitive. We did not legislate it from the perspective of uh, the Industry and Innovation Committee in which I sit. I was the rapporteur on that part of the file, but it's a, it's, it's a file that also brings in the Civil Liberties Committee, the Internal Market Committee, uh, and the three uh, working uh, together. Uh, so in a way, uh, Europe wanted to make sure that uh, the technology is according to our values and, and principle, and that's the way it's being uh, developed. Because often we've heard critics saying, well, is it going to, you know, propel innovation and so on? And I think we have good measures in there. But I think if Europe wants to invest further 
in some of the opportunities that this technology bring forward, we'll need to think of other ways to encourage investments, um, to encourage uh, further breakthroughs um, and uh, developments. Um, so it's a horizontal type of uh, legislation. Um, it is done in a in, in a in a so say a pyramid uh, way. So you have banned practices, you have certain practices that are considered high risk, and other practices that don't necessarily fall in the in in, in the remits of this uh, legislation. Um, so it's not covering entire sectors, but it's covering specific uh, uses. Uh, it would cover things like whether someone should receive a, a bank loan or deciding where a person gets hired or fired. Uh, this would be things on the more high risk spectrum of, of, of use cases, um, just so that the audience can, can get a sense um, of it. Um, and these are all topics that citizens care about, and we believe that should you know, you ever want to request information, know why a certain system has taken a decision A instead of decision B, uh, could further help uh, with strengthening social trust in technologies because you'll be able to receive an explanation and so on and, and so forth. I'm of course explaining things in a very brief manner right now uh, and giving just few uh, concrete uh, uh, examples. Um, but very soon the final text uh, will be uh, available for everyone um, uh, to take um, a look. Um, so this is in, in very, very brief terms um, about the AI Act. Uh, but indeed, this is not the only rule book uh, in town. Um, and in, if, if once some of the uh, other initiatives were out there, such as the White House Executive Order or the G7 um, Codes of Conduct, uh, the UK Summit and its conclusions, um, I think there's one thing that's clear out of all these um, various initiatives is that we are trying to, in a way, get ahead on AI and show that we are in control. Um, and many have painted these developments as strikingly divergent, divergent from uh, one another. Um, but I think, uh, you know, yes, the EU is, as in usual way, having more binding regulatory approach. The rest of the world is opting for voluntary uh, measures, but I don't think the picture is necessarily so black and white. Um, I think we can still avoid uh, regulatory uh, fragmentation. I think there are differences in philosophies and technological priorities, but there's also a lot of convergence between uh, democracies when it comes to underlying uh, values. Um, I think the EU AI Act prioritizes many of the same principles that the US uh, uh, executive order uh, on AI uh, proposes when it comes to privacy, when it comes to uh, innovation, we have very much the same uh, approach. Uh, also on foundational uh, models, uh, the different uh, initiatives all focus only on the most powerful AI models, and so does the European uh, AI Act. Um, we have pushed hard for there to be a two-tier approach to general purpose AI uh, systems, and this is the case now. So not all uh, generative uh, AI or general purpose, that's the way we call them, uh, AI systems would fall into the remits of the legislation. Um, the more powerful you are, the, the you would be subject to more restrictions, uh, basically. That's the thinking uh, behind it. And then once again, I think the way uh, all those different initiatives, the way we see boosting innovation with concrete measures um, is uh, very, very uh, similar. Uh, but I do agree, uh, maybe as a final point, that there needs to be uh, some sort of a... Um, elevation of those measures and people sitting around the same uh, table because uh, often um, you could see that uh, some some of us are part of some of those initiatives and others are not you could see one ceo meeting with a prime minister then in a congressional hearing and then meeting with meps and kind of there's there's too little um there's a lot of initiatives going on but 
we rarely, with civil society, with the public sector, with the private sector, we rarely sit at the same table together, look at what has been agreed, look what's currently being worked on and try to kind of better understand each other. I think we're still in a way working uh, in silos and I would like this to change. And this is why with a couple of um, yeah people that we've been working over the past couple of years and we've seen those gap um, within be between these three different, so say, main stakeholders in, in the discussion, we would like to change that. And we're proposing something called the Council on the on, on the Future uh, to address some of those tech gaps in, 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 in between those different stakeholders. Hmm. Uh, how, how do you see this, Josh, this multitude of different approaches? Is it a problem or can they be complementary or, or is the EU sort of setting the, the, the standard here as a first mover? Um, I, I think no. So we've been we've been following a lot of this, and Eva's participated in some of our discussions in the forum cooperation in AI, which we run between with us and SEPs. And so we've been looking looking at these multitude of approaches for, for many years now. Um, and, I, and I think Eva really laid out the similarities and differences in, in a really great way. Um, you, you start from the point, I think, that particularly amongst the, say, democracies, but we can talk about China as well shortly, uh, there is a lot of similar underlying goals, certainly values. And so the, and, and the objective is really in terms of you've got to build essentially trust in in the AI systems um, if you will if you want to be successful economically and on a trade front so in, in a sense there is a neat confluence between you want to address the risks appropriately in order to build the trust to have the economic opportunity happen as well uh, but you so so you have you have this common starting point uh, the OECD AI principles, which which you know the US and the EU and Japan and China have all signed on to, for instance, so we have some baseline there in terms of what we think about in terms of a framework for AI ethics. Uh, you certainly see the private sector that is developing a lot of these foundational AI models have been for a number of years now developing their own internal ethical kind of guardrails to make sure that their developers develop responsible, trustworthy AI as well. So that's an important piece because... Unlike other technologies in the past, this one is heavily being developed by the private sector. And certainly these sort of cutting edge foundational models um, are not entirely in the in the private sector, um, but, you know, are in the private sector and amongst large companies. And, and the costs of developing these models will probably mean that it will remain like that for a while. So what the private sector does, um, you know, whether at the in response to laws, regulations, principles that come out from the governments or whether just as a good sort of set of corporate practices is going to be sort of fundamental in terms of what we ultimately get in the marketplace. But we do have different approaches. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's stark, actually, that despite the similar starting points, governments across the world have actually gone in quite different ways. And so the EU is certainly you know, done its approach, which, which Eva's outlined. I think it's interesting, actually, to look at where the UK is headed in, in this space. Obviously, um, no longer part of, you know, the EU, but a very significant player, nevertheless, in the European space. Uh, it, it, it's, I think, a third of AI startups are in the UK. It's a very big kind of, you know, player in, in that respect. And they've, they, they've come out, they've been developing this approach for a while, but they're very clear that they're not going to legislate, right? They've basically put out some principles. They want this to guide regulators who then take those principles and apply it in their kind of regulatory specific use cases. They have a sandbox. They kind of learn from how those principles are actually being applied by the regulators. They may at some point they flagged, they may legislate that the regulators have to take it down to the principles, but there's no vision for, you know, an omnibus kind of overarching piece of legislation, right? So quite a different approach, right? It's very iterative. It's heavy in the emphasis on learning and being pro-innovation um, and, and so forth. If you look at, um, you know, the US, the US has also got this kind of mixed bag approach, I would say, where they have um, leaned into this executive order on AI. So they're very, very focused on um, taking common sets of principles around civil liberties and non-discrimination and security and safety and so forth and requiring a governments to make sure that the way they use AI is consistent with these approaches. At the same time, making sure government's got the resources and actually the kind of capacity to actually do this. So there's actually a parallel effort to train and build up that capacity. And then actually through the government procurement lever, 
um, you know, which is actually a very powerful one to kind of make sure that the purchasing of AI systems from the private sector reflects these types of principles and norms as outlined in the executive order. So they're, they're leaning into that approach. But again, it's not it's not legislation. It's iterative um, and it's quite sort of principles based and a learning by doing type approach there. You also have a couple of other things happening, which I think are important um, broadly, and I'll, I'll get to that shortly, but certainly, um, you know, there's the US be very focused on standards development, and this is going to be obviously a huge sort of next sort of series of work that will be happening in the EU as well through SENLAC and, and the European standard setting bodies to set the standards over the next couple of years that will really matter in terms of, I think, how the AI Act hits the ground in practice for businesses and will also, I think, be determinative in many ways in terms of whether these different regulatory approaches um, are able to kind of talk to each other or be interoperable or actually create kind of, you know, friction and barriers. And so you've seen the, the, the NIST has developed this AI risk management framework, which could be the basis for sort of a common enterprise approach to managing AI risk. They lean heavily on existing international AI standards to inform that approach. You see a lot of cooperation between the US and the EU now through the Trade and Technology Council on trying to find common approaches to standards as well. And so I think there are there's an awareness that this matters and it will be important. Uh, how this plays out, I think we'll we'll see over the next couple of years, certainly. And so, you, so you see, so there is there are these different approaches. I think, I think the EU is, so, is certainly, um, you know, has taken a particular approach in this omnibus kind of binding kind of rules based approach. In terms of the, you know, uh, yeah, Eva, I think is you know really subtly, um, but I think appropriately sort of emphasise the need to focus a bit more, and Eva, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but on competitiveness and innovation, um, <laughs> and yeah, and and I think it's an interesting. I, I think it's a really important part of the conversation because if if you go back to the beginning of what happened in Europe, um, there was this emphasis. There was, it was sort of two pillars, right? It was like risk and and competitiveness and innovation. And from yeah, you know, where I sit at least, it, I there's a sense that the innovation competitiveness piece has fallen off um, the agenda a little, and and there's been a heavy focus on on the risk piece. And I think, as I said at the beginning. That's somewhat appropriate. I think we do need to address risk clearly and we need to create social license and buy-in and trust in the systems. So it's it's a, it's an important element. But I think it, it, there, there's always a risk, I think, of overdoing the risk part um, and missing out on, on the innovation part as well. And again, maybe I'll just make two quick points. This sort of come back, comes back to my earlier point about a lot of AI systems um, are fairly enterprise orientated they're not going to raise necessarily even privacy and security or any of these other concerns. They're not going to be consumer facing. They're going to be business to business. So a lot of the types of discrimination and fairness concerns that we worry about when it's a bank loan to a consumer or education don't necessarily play out in that space, but will really be the key drivers, I think, of the productivity enhancing opportunities that a lot of these systems will put in there. And that is, you know, about, capacity, it's about training, it's about access to AI compute, and it's about sort of making sure that it's, you know, the broader economy, the small businesses, as well as the large businesses that can use these systems. And and the final piece, I think, a little in terms of the, the intersection with the innovation will be a little on what, how this, a lot of this will be how this actually plays out on the ground, and particularly what it will mean for smaller businesses. Um, I, I don't, I'm, I'm always a little leery of kind of, you know, overstating the role of small businesses. I think they're very important, but, you know, a lot of the innovation and R&D and capital spending happens in larger businesses. Small businesses tend to want to be large businesses, but they are important employers. And this is where a lot of kind of, you need both in a healthy economy, you need the small startups and the businesses and the large businesses. And it is always the case that, regulation is more costly for small businesses than for large businesses. And so the the, the costs on the innovation side, I think in many respects will 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 often be what what does it mean for small businesses? How do they comply? What are the costs going to be like? And, and I think that's still something we need to we need to see. Yeah, but that's always a balance between regulation and innovation. And as you said, Eva, EU sin tend to be more on, on the regulation and the EU is more on, on the innovation and can debate on, on where the balance is. Uh, but, but but of course, the, 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 the values and the principles and the ethics and the attempt to sort of at least set up some 
some limits or guardrails for for the the risks to mitigate them that that's one thing but then the whole standard setting which is more technical and this is by definition as you have explained so 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 eloquently this is a very innovative business the whole ai business and it changes and it goes very quickly so so for companies to be able to navigate there yes there are the risk but also the, the basic things that we talked about in, in the beginning customs facilitation translation logistics uh, lower costs uh, supply chains management uh, and, and so on um they would want to have the same standards and if they are slightly bigger companies trading with the whole world they want eu europe and and asia to be more or less on on the same uh, on on the same stage there in order not to 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 be be forced to do the three different uh, types so so how how do we navigate that because in asia there are very little regulation as well i mean there are principles and there are roadmaps and and there are these um, uh, sandboxes where where different innovations are tested especially in electric vehicles but the and even China has very little regulation per se on this. So, so how, how can you navigate there as, as a company, big or small? Eva, you want to start? Um, yeah, I can provide my personal, so let's say, uh, thoughts on, 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 on this um, very briefly and mainly from a little bit of European perspective. And I'm probably a little bit over critical of the efforts um, that we are doing, but I think um, we have to understand that over the past four or five years, we focus more on providing the guardrails rather than at least finding the balance of uh, supporting investments, attracting investments, making sure we have the prepared professionals um, to fill those uh, potential jobs uh, that are there, um, making sure that companies receive uh, the right support at the right uh, time, uh, but also in a way changing the mindset of, of what sort of power do we want to uh, project? Um, because to a very big extent, um, and, and we are proud of that, and it's a good thing. I think one of the reasons why Europe is uh, the continent where many would like to live, uh, many would like to also start their business or, or study or to come to Europe is partially because of our values. We've managed to create the European Union because of our values. We've managed to build on all those successes because of the values. Um, and this is why I am hopeful that European companies uh, that would like to develop AI in Europe or any other company would like to do it in the same way um, until uh, just like uh, we've done an, until now. But in the same time, we are in a global competition that is getting more and more fierce by the day. And I think uh, when we would put forward an act like the AI Act, we need to be thinking or legislative efforts like the DMA and the DSA, because I, I think these are two um, legislative files that are quite well known beyond uh, Europe um, and again are in the tech uh, space and, and domain. Uh, we need to be thinking, how does this fit our broader approach and our broader thinking? And what does Europe truly wants to achieve? Because um, I think five years ago, we wanted to set the rules in the green uh, space with the green deal. But many of my colleagues say today, yeah, we got the green route, but where is the deal? We are missing the deal. We, we don't see the deal. Um, and one could see that when, when you speak to uh, companies on the ground, and these are some of the largest European companies, but also smaller companies. And when you also speak to certain regions in Europe, which do not have their resources uh, to necessarily meet the ambitious uh, goals and aims of, of the green deal. So I think we should have thought a little bit differently how we approach this past four years while providing guardrails, while providing ambitious targets, we should have simultaneously tried to provide incentives, opportunities, investments um, to Europe. I think the wake-up call, and it's, it's, it's a little bit sad to say, but in a way the wake-up call was the IRA. Um, and many of us have been calling for a more balanced and different approach towards competitiveness for the past four or five years. 
Um, so now uh, the commission is setting up certain expert groups uh, to look into uh, how the, the next four or five years is all about uh, competitiveness. Um, but um, I, I just think we need to be more clear how do we see Europe developing in the years to come? Because we have had big projects, Eurozone, Schengen, single market. What is the next big project for Europe? Um, where, is, where are our strengths? Um, where can we strengthen some of the strengths that we have? Um, and I think this is an important discussion to be, to be had. And I think because we are faced with multiple um, crisis and challenges, this does not mean we should not have that conversation. Um, where is the economic potential in Europe lying? Um, you know, a couple of years ago, not too long time ago, we had uh, 10 of the 15 largest companies um, in um, um, in in wind and solar. Now we have barely two or three of those. So um, if we would have wanted to lead in clean tech, for example, well, somehow we needed to plan for that. And again, I'm overly critical. There's a number of areas where um, we're, you know, we're we're doing well. But the common feeling when you speak to businesses in Europe is that we don't we lack direction uh, of how to uh, reap all the potentials of emerging tech that is out there. Um, we focus so much on putting the guardrails. We've had so many conversations uh, about the rules. And we had so little conversations about how uh, to reap the potential. So we say there has to be a potential. Something has to be done. We need to reap the fruit and we need to take you know, advantage of what's going on. But we don't really have a strategy. And as I said, it won't come as a communication from the commission to say to businesses what to do. But businesses currently feel like they have so much regulation to think about but they can't even think on how to make sure they can grow. And this comes in every conversation I had, whether it's the European Roundtable of Industrialists, whether it's any other business association. Um, and so I, I do think um, this conversation has to happen and Europe needs to um, have a better overview uh, where it wants to invest and how it wants to develop. Um, should we are to lead in certain areas or at least be part of the part of the game, let's put it this way. We should not always be the referee. Important issues uh, indeed. And as the European Union is now entering in the election campaign for the European Parliament in June, I think many of these issues will be debated uh, indeed. But, but coming back, Yusha, to, to this question you know, of, of different standards, the US, China, US, Asia, Europe, how do you see those difficulties or could it be a possibility for, for business to develop their own standards and sort of move before policymakers? Yeah, I, I well, so, um, no, I, I think I think we're 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 increasingly um, we're in a world of, of diverging technology standards. I, I think that's a reality. I mean, there's diverging. There's going to be diverging technology standards. Uh, between the West broadly and, and China. I mean, you said before, China has actually got a couple of interesting, um, you know, developments. You know, they've got a recommendation algorithm piece there. They've got something on deep synthesis, and now they, they recently did something on generative AI. So they are regulating, but the markets are splintering, particularly around, you know, critical technologies, certainly around AI. We've seen that uh, with access to semiconductors and so forth. And so that that is a trend which seems to me somewhat baked in, um, there is cooperation, though, with China on international standards, so it's not a completely lost gain, but I think that those markets are developing somewhat differently, and that seems to be the trend line. I think the challenge and the question is going to be how do you make sure that despite the diverting regulatory differences between Europe, uh, the US, but even, as you said, Cecilia, if you look at Japan or South Korea, um, there are different approaches happening globally. I, I've written quite a bit about, you know, there's a there's a space, I think, for trade agreements here to really knit some of this together. It's not a popular argument in Washington at the moment, but at some point we've we've got a foundation mm. already in trade agreements around digital trade and source code and but also important things. We've had commitments on um, cooperation on standards. We have actually some really important tools going back to the WTO on, you know, basing regulation on international standards, right, from the, the WTO TBT agreement or having risk-based approaches to regulation 
in the SPS, the Sanitary, sanitary Space. You can imagine taking these principles that we are familiar with and applying them to the technology space. There's a common approach to risk-based regulation for AI. We could actually essentially turn that into a commitment. We could expand the commitments to use international standards in our regulations from a goods-focused, TBT-orientated approach to a services approach, to a digital services approach, to sort of provide a bit more kind of rule-based underpinning, which would lead to more commonality. Another important thing is going to be conformity assessment. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you have different standards in different countries, I mean, the reality of is that's the world today, right? Europe regulates chemicals differently to the way the US does. Europe regulates autos differently to the way the US does. So manufacturers are manufacturing these products for different markets to meet different standards and requirements already. But what you do want is mutual recognition. You want to know that when you actually, for instance, meet those standards, that your process of meeting them is recognised by, you know, the essentially the market mm -hmm. that you're going into. So we could essentially have more mutual recognition around, you know, the types of AI standards that we're applying. We could have a sort of common agreement around that. We're going to have to require auditing um, to be developed in a more kind of sophisticated way because a lot of this will be done by private companies. So we need to have trust that these are being applied in a way that we can then just accept them into our market. A lot of this would go a long way, I think, to overcoming the regulatory costs for businesses to essentially operate in different markets. Uh, but that's still a very early stage conversation. But we have a lot of tools. We have a lot of familiarity with these conversations in different areas. It's just a question now of thinking about this more creatively, I think, in the digital kind of AI space. Hmm. Well, we, we're running out of, of time. We're approaching the, the hour. We, there's two questions coming in from the audience. One you kind of um, answered already, but I read them out, both of them, and then you can you can choose how you want to answer before we wrap up. The first is, are we getting a little bit ahead of ourselves? AI apparently still has a way to go in areas where it supposedly is transforming operations. And the other one is, does the trajectory of AI technological development lend itself more to concentration of economic power as in uh, as in the much of the current IT revolution than in a more distributed way. Is that all bad? Well, that's a big question. Uh, you want to jump on any of this as as uh, the, the last, Eva? Yeah, I can, because I would need to literally drop in a minute. I will maybe just very briefly address the first one, if, if that's OK. Um, so I think it's a it's a it's a great question. It's something, of course, we ask uh, ourselves, and I think from you know oh, experts oh, that we speak to and and we read, of course, AI has a long way to go to deliver its its full potential. From a regulatory perspective, having in mind that also the leaps in advancement in technologies are shorter, faster better. I think from a regulatory perspective uh, and public sector perspective, it makes sense to be a little bit uh, ahead of the curve. And this is why I think, you know, I've maybe two years ago, I was way more critical on the work we were doing um, on the AI Act. Today, I feel it's, it's a good balance that we've put uh, out there. Um, because um, we, we need some sort of guardrails, uh, as I said, if we want this technology uh, to be developed according uh, to our values. Uh, but in the same time, we need to be uh, agile. Um, and I think um, this is why we've also proposed to have a certain thing called maybe the AI office. I don't know, some of you might have heard it's part of the, of the legislation because we wanna be able to assess trends. We wanna be able to anticipate. We wanna see when, you know, how can we adapt uh, best and, and better. Um, I think the time has come to rethink it. Something that I said in the very beginning, the way our collaboration between the public, the private and civil society sector, when it comes to the development of emerging tech is happening uh, at the moment. Uh, traditional regulatory measures are important and they still need to be part of, but the way we feed into that process has to change. And it goes through something that probably will be difficult. Maybe one could say even impossible, but the trust between these three main actors has to change and the understanding of one another's positions also has to change. Currently, everyone's on the defensive. We feel like everyone's the bad guy, depending on who you talk and who you ask. But if we are to make sense of the rules we put on the table, if companies are 
to grasp those rules, not to say I'll I'll do the bare minimum as much as I won't be charged or I won't be uh, sued and, and so on. Sometimes companies would need to come up with a broader societal responsibility. And sometimes legislators would also need to understand that maybe technology truly isn't able to deliver what we expect that it can deliver. And civil society also has to be part of that conversation. Very, very importantly, um, academia, of course, as well, part of, of civil society. And so for, the, for this social trust to happen and to build, I think we need to reestablish the way we, we communicate and make sure we can bridge some of the gaps uh, that exist out there. Thank you. And I'm so sorry I can't stay any longer, but I, I, I have to run. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva Maidel from the European uh, Parliament. Thank you for those uh, final words. Uh, Yosha, do you have one more minute to say something about the concentration of economic power and AI, whether that is related in your view? Yeah, I, I think I think certainly uh, we're in we're in a world. On some, I I don't agree with the first statement, but I think Eva covered it off. Um, so let me just address the second one very briefly. I, I um yes, absolutely, and and I think that there's a risk of a, a divide between a, a, a sub even a subset of developed countries and certainly developing worlds. So I think how do we make sure that this doesn't exacerbate existing economic divides? I think it's going to be absolutely crucial um that's a development agenda the un is sort of wading into this space but really there's a big role here for civil society for industry for governments to come together and to really understand what the needs are and this is about the ai stack this is may not be every country is not going to develop cloud computing and frontier models but you can have uh the resources the access to the compute maybe it's on the cloud um better training better technical capacity building if you look at what's happening in Nigeria or South Africa or Kenya, for that matter. There's a lot in the AI space to be optimistic about, but a lot more is needed to expand that out. And so that's, I think, an important agenda. Then I think there is sort of a, you know, there is obviously a complex debate which has been playing out in the United States. It plays out in Europe around the economic co concentration, you know, of large technology companies, the foundational AI models that are very expensive and data intensive may, may exacerbate um, some of that concentration, um, what that means, whether it's good or bad, I don't think we've got time to get into yeah. now. But again, I think we need to sort of have a broader conversation uh, about the opportunity space for AI and how do you expand it um, out to businesses broadly. This is not just, I think, a conversation around technology companies, but it's really an economy-wide conversation about how does this become an economy-wide general purpose accessible technology. Thank you so much, Joshua Meltzer from, from the Brookings uh, Institution. Um, I, I, I have sort of learned a lot. I feel that there's so much more we could discuss about this. We're just sort of t approaching the, the subject uh, in, 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 in some of the layers, but there's so much more to say. Uh, thank you to all of you who have listened. Uh, thank you, Joshua, again, and uh, have a nice evening, afternoon or day, wherever you are. Goodbye. Thanks a lot.